Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, wonderful Microsoft community, art lovers, technology lovers, technology creators. It is my very great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Trimpin. He is a musician, an artist, an inventor, a delighter. Trimpin's work has pushed the boundaries of art and technology, inspiring audiences around the world. Trimpin's groundbreaking kinetic sculptures integrate sound, music, and physical form across a variety of media, including fixed installations, live music, theater, and dance performances. Amongst other things, he has created a six-story high microtonal xylophone running through a spiral staircase in an Amsterdam theater, a water, a water fountain installation in which drops of water timed in complex rhythmic fugues drip into glass receptacles, a dance piece using dancers' bodies to make music. He has invented a gamelan whose iron bells are suspended in air by electronic magnets, and he's invented machines to play every instrument in the orchestra using uh, via MIDI commands. His installations and performances have been seen at the Seattle Art Museum, the Henry Art Gallery, Suyama Space, the Museum of Glass, the Muse Missoula Museum of Art, San Jose Museum of Art, and also in the Vancouver International Jazz Festival in Vancouver, Canada. His iconic work, a tornado-shaped tower of guitars, if six was nine, robots and branches, serves as a centerpiece for Seattle's Experience Music Project, the EMP. Trimpin is a recipient of numerous honors, including the 1997 MacArthur Genius Award. He is the subject of Peter Esmond's documentary film, Trimpin, The Sound of Invention featuring music by the Kronos Quartet. In 2010, he received an honorary doctor of, music, of musical arts from the California Institute of Arts. And since the fall of 2010, Trimpin has worked with students and faculty both at Stanford's, uh, Stanford's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics to create the multimedia installation, The Gers Zyklus, in collaboration with composer, director, and performer Rinde Eckhart. Most recently, he's been commissioned by the Seattle Symphony to create a symphonic work using gesture um, scheduled to premiere in May 2015 with Ludovic Morlot conducting. Please join me in welcoming our very honored guest, Trimpin. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to do this presentation. and. Uh, and we can start right now, like with this picture. Here's actually my grandmother on the right, all my uh, family. And the picture was taken in 19, uh, around 1921. And the lady in the middle, she has some kind of a device in her hand. You would probably call it today the eye, eye uh, part or whatever. It's very similar. So. Um, when I was about, uh, and here my grandfather uh, on the right, sitting on his desk and in front of this tube radio, which he was building after World War I. And uh, when I was a boy, about nine years old, I found this tube radio in our attic. And of course, I didn't know what it was. I was uh, interested, uh, asking my parents, what, what is this? And, and immediately my mother said, never plug it in into 220 volts. It's too dangerous. Of course, as soon as it was gone, I plugged it in. And I couldn't believe what kind of sounds out of this box came out, like mostly kind of short wave, high pitched sounds. And with uh, moving these copper coils, you could modulate the sounds. It was almost like a, playing like a musical instrument. So this was kind of my first introduction uh, to how to manipulate sound. But at the same time, I was uh, also studying, uh, starting to study uh, brass instruments, like the flugelhorn. And uh, for some reason, I was always kind of uh, disappointed that the sound of this flugelhorn or this trumpet was kind of uh, monophonic, 
So you could only play one note at a time, not like a piano, you could play multiple notes. Like this was kind of a restriction. So I was starting to uh, modify certain kind of instruments, adding some other parts to it, like a trombone with two horns, like a stereophonic trombone or the trumpet had a slide, so you could go into microtonal kind of uh, parts uh, in music. So this was kind of the uh, early challenge to, to uh, figure out how to modify instruments so they would sound different from the traditional instrument. And uh, you just need uh, a blowtorch, like a plumber's torch, and you can make this, it's very simple. Uh, to, to heat up this brass tubing and just make different co configurations. And like this trumpet uh, was, um, uh, with this trumpet it was possible to play it like the three valves, like a regular trumpet, but then with the slide you really could change like the, the whole harmonic spectrum of this instrument. Or then uh, like with this uh, stereophonic trum trombone. But about 10 years uh, into start uh, practicing all these instruments, um, an allergy on my lips started to get uh, irritated. And then I was starting, my music teacher told me to switch to reed instruments. So I was switching to uh, saxophone and, and uh, clarinet. And then my tongue started to uh, get infected. So eventually I had to quit completely practicing and uh, I, I couldn't touch these instruments anymore. So then I was starting to think about what happened to my lips. Can I actually make a, a can I draw my lips? Because suddenly I was dealing with my lips and, and uh, I was figuring out uh, what my lips actually was doing. And similar uh, to my hands, I was starting to carve hands. Uh, one hand would play the trumpet with the valve, the left one would uh, use the slide the, from the trombone. So it was just kind of learning how to sculpt your hands. Like it was more like uh, how to visualize what is going on, what, what did your hand actually do. And uh, so this was kind of the uh, experimentation. I didn't have any formal training in, in, uh, in sculpture and starting to make photographs out of my mouthpieces I, I used, like because I couldn't touch them anymore, or starting to use my instruments I used before in a different way, more as a sculptural element. And this was uh, kind of the way to, to uh, not comprehend, but to, to, to deal with the situation of not being anymore, uh, practicing anymore these instruments to, to try to uh, still work with, with the instruments, but uh, in, in a different way. So it was just like different uh, uh, ways to, to put a mouthpiece on a, on a trumpet or a reed uh, uh, mouthpiece on, on, like the reed mouthpiece on a trumpet or a regular mouthpiece on the saxophone. So it was just like, um, different constellations of instruments, making a picture frame and making photographs. And that was kind of the introduction uh, to deal with the situation more like uh, separate myself physically. And, uh, and then I was starting, I couldn't start uh, studying music. So I went in, in, uh, in a different, more in a different field. Uh, it was like social pedagogic in, in German. Uh, it's like, uh, dealing more in, uh, with uh, psychology. And in this field, I was focusing on theater and music, more as therapy, like occupational therapy, how to work with people uh, in this field in, in music and theater. And uh, at the same time, I was also starting to uh, build set design. And one set design was uh, uh, for uh, Beckett's, uh, Samuel Beckett's end game. And actually Beckett di was directing, uh, he was a director. I was living at this time and studying in Berlin. And I worked with Beckett for uh, probably a couple of years uh, on, different, different, uh, uh, on different pieces. So living in Berlin, 
Uh, what's also like a part of it, I was looking more for um, instruments, for some other kind of sculptural pieces, and I was running on the flea market in some kind of a tin can, a round tin can with a label on it. And the label was almost like a, a record label. There was like a, an artist, it was almost like a, a record inside, but it was just a, a, a spool of wire. And I didn't know exactly what, how it was possible to, to put, you know, like uh, music or speech or whatever on a piece of wire, uh, researching a little bit more. And then um, I thought, how can I listen to this wire? So uh, what I did, I had this toy clown, like this unicycle toy clown. And at this time, I was experimenting with uh, this Japanese reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorders. So I did, um, let's see how, uh, uh, I put some amplifier on the back of this clown. And here, there was like the, the pickup from, from the, uh, or the, the, the tape head. And as soon the clown would, would go down, unicycle down the, the wire, you could listen what it was recorded on this wire. So in the 1930s, uh, before they was recording on plastic tape, like on cassette tape, uh, you would actually record on wire tape. And there is a wire recorder which was made uh, in the 1930s and 40s, but I was more, uh, I didn't have this wire recorder, so I made my own wire recorder. So every time the, the clowns would unicycle back and forth, uh, these wires, you would actually listen what was recorded on this, uh, on this wire. So then I thought, when it's possible to put memory in a piece of wire, it would maybe also be possible to put uh, memory on a piece of paper. So I was starting this uh, magnetic scores so I would draw some staff lines, and I was filing a very fine metal dust, uh, mix it with alcohol. I uh, brushed it on this uh, piece of paper, and then I used the same kind of technique, like a, a record player hat and a microphone with an amplifier, and I would just talk or sing along the staff lines, and then the audience would do in a gallery when this was up, would do the same. They would just follow with the reading head from the tape recorder with a headphone so they could actually listen what was recorded on this piece of paper. So this was kind of uh, the way how I learned how memory works because memory is just like to memorize some uh, speech or music or whatever it is, some other information. It's, it, it was a very simple process to, 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 to learn how memory works when, when you just can do it yourself with some metal dust and, and, and a pickup system. So uh, I was starting to um, do different kind of uh, uh, drawings where all this uh, information, mostly music and speech, was recorded on, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, paper. And at the same time, I was also interested in, in memory, how memory uh, worked, uh, going back to the Belgium um, inventor, uh, Jacquard, who invented the automatic loom, where you could uh, put some cardboard, perforated cardboard uh, information in the loom, and then it would leave out a pattern. So I was starting to build like a, a player, similar like a player piano punch, so where I could uh, put information in a piece of paper and then having an optical uh, reading mechanism, like an optical reader who would read this information. But so the memory was just on, on, on a piece of paper, but then playing it back, uh, you could use this kind of reader. And then of course, everything had to be wire wrapped. So this was uh, before uh, you, you you did it on a printed circuit board. It was all done by hand, like each connection that it's the back of a printed circuit, or it wasn't a printed circuit board, it was just like a, a circuit board. But this was all uh, done by hand, from, from pin to pin uh, to, to wire these chips. So this was my first uh, computer, like music computer, the keyboard up there, whatever you played would be memorized 
And here uh, you could see with LEDs which node what was playing, which channel. And this was way before MIDI existed. This was uh, in the late 70s and, and early 1980s. And, and this was my disk drive. Because uh, before uh, you had like uh, this expensive, or I couldn't afford an expensive disk drive, you would actually uh, buy cassette tapes where certain programs was, was available. So you would put the cassette in the cassette player, the computer would read this information, and that's how you got the memory from the cassette tape into your memory, uh, for, into your computer. So I was starting first with four tape machines, and none of uh, the tapes, uh, there was no audio on these tapes. It was just like a, a digital uh, information stored on these tapes. So first I had like four of them, and then I needed eight, and then 16. So when you played something back, uh, you had to put all the tapes in the right position, and then you would say, uh, push the button play, and then it would retrieve the memory. So it was quite time consuming, but it worked quite well. But one morning I came uh, back to my studio, the whole thing collapsed. It was too heavy, it was on the floor, and then it was time to buy a real disk drive. <laughs> so other uh, interaction was uh, using like a, a, a saxophone, which had uh, sensitive keypads. So every time you would uh, play the key on, on the saxophone, it would be going into the memory base or hooking up a, a percussionist with, with his uh, heartbeat sensor. So the own uh, heartbeat would uh, determine somehow the rhythm or, or, or a different heartbeat. And it was always uh, hard to, like I was never trained uh, as a, uh, I had basic training in electricity, but not in computer science or in, in that was all uh, strange. So I had to read some kind of boring literature once in a while to learn how to uh, use this circuitry. But when I was thinking of a circuitry, one time I needed um, uh, a random number generator. So I thought, well, you can probably buy a chip uh, which uh, has everything built in, but uh, I was building my own random, random number generator using like these bobbing chickens. You might remember. Uh, uh, so they had like reflectors on their head. So every time they went down, there was like an optical sensor down there. So every time it would make a, a, a contact or it gave the uh, information. So there was like 24 of them. And they had some small uh, flashlight light bulbs under there, but they, they would constantly move, always, they would always be in, in motion. So when you have like 24 going on, it's like a 24 bit configuration. So you get over a million possibilities uh, just using these chickens, but they would. Um, would then drive a, a selectric typewriter with solenoids on top of the keyboard. So it was more like a percussion instrument first, but about almost 10 years ago, there was a retrospective going on about my work. And uh, I worked with a software designer. So we actually uh, used the same system, which was done 19, probably in the early 80s. But instead of just playing randomly, uh, the typewriter and printing out garbage or nothing interesting. We used uh, for, uh, this was like when, when Bush, he's actually up there, was still president. Uh, we used the radio addresses which Bush every Saturday, Saturday gave and stored the unique words. And uh, so every time uh, a chicken would bob, it would select a word printing it out here on the selectric typewriter and form a sentence. So you could in real time uh, listen and, and see what they would compose, what kind of sentence out of this radio addresses. And some sentences was completely kind of um, chaotic, but some of them made more sense than the real uh, talk uh, from, from this radio addresses. So it was quite interesting to see uh, how this works. And you had to insert 25 cents and then it was starting to, to, to type. So it, it's, uh, 
just like a way how uh, to visualize how a random number generator actually looks like what they are doing. And you can hear, you can read, everything is kind of visualized how, how this would work. Or also like in the early 80s, I used uh, pottery wheels, like pottles using, you know, like these wheels and, and made these record players. And it was kind of a smart motor, uh, um, uh, electric motor, which know exactly how fast, uh, which direction, when to stop. And uh, so all of these eight record players, they could start at the same time and stop or go backwards, forwards. And I used to use uh, like instructional records, uh, like for example, how to learn the language of money or how to quit smoking without willpower. And there was all these instructional records and somehow they would just have this uh, very uh, strange conversation going on because it, one was, would talk about how to quit smoking, the next one how to basically screw somebody else uh, to make a lot of money. And, and uh, so it was quite a obscure and, and uh, interesting conversation or using some of the same records, like uh, there was once uh, a singer, his name was Wayne Newton, and uh, I used uh, eight of the Wayne Newton records, and he was sing singing Danke Shane, and it would start like uh, quite normal, they would all start together, but then it would go out of phase, and then it would go backwards, so it didn't sound anymore like Danke Shane. But interestingly, when, when you play Danke Shane backwards, it was sounding like Bin Laden for some reason. So, uh, <laughs> so this was kind of early kind of uh, installations because uh, there was no way how to capture sound in, in, in memory, like to process sound. The sound could only be processed in real time using this kind of uh, records or other kind of sound making devices. And it was always interactive. So when it was set up somewhere, uh, the audience could actually push a button or play somehow with some other keyboards to get this going. And then uh, other instruments like from found objects like uh, uh, kitchen uh, utensils, uh, kitchen stuff or cymbals. And there was all with electromechanical uh, devices uh, operated. And at this time, uh, MIDI, and MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which was uh, kind of in the early 80s, different, different companies came together and said we need some kind of a unified uh, communication system where all these instruments can talk to each other without having uh, 10 or 20 different kind of protocols. So the MIDI protocol made it uh, very simple to, to have other instruments, uh, like percussion instruments, they had all this kind of... Uh, mechanical, electromechanical solenoid devices where uh, they would be controlled via MIDI. Or uh, making sound like with bowed symbols, like there was kind of a, a belt and a motor, and then you could have sustain, like long sustained sound uh, made possible uh, by uh, percussive instruments like, like the cymbals, like more kind of long sustained sound. And, and it depends on, on the speed of the bell, belt, uh, what kind of harmonics you would, would actually hear. Or starting to think about uh, how certain strings are kind of uh, like a violinist bowed, or like the cello had like a, a bowing mechanism. So I was more interested to bow, let's say, very slow, which you couldn't do by hand because you would start to jerk a little bit. But with a certain kind of uh, transmission of the motor, you have the bow very precisely uh, going back and forth. But on the other hand, on the other side, there was another motor who would take care of the tension of, of, of the bow to the string. So you, you could be uh, creating complete different sounds coming out of a cello than uh, you actually could do by hand. Or like a, a portable tuba, this was for a, a theater production. And also sometimes uh, a coin-operated uh, uh, object. This was like uh, in, in England, there was like a serious spitting image. And there was like this head of Gorbachev 
uh, Reagan back there is Thatcher and, and old Bush, and then Mr. T would conduct and, and the wrestlers. So when you inserted 25 cents, and this was a TV, an empty TV, uh, they would just, a drum machine would just uh, play a, a percussive sound, but they would beat each other in, in the same rhythm. <laughs> So, and, and one time uh, I was uh, teaching for a few years, working at the Swaling Conservatorium in Amsterdam, and I had to uh, give a class for video artists uh, how to um, think about images and sound and everything. So I had to come up with a sculpture, and uh, I, was, uh, I had to look for over 100 Dutch wooden shoes, and, uh, and each shoe had like a, a, a mallet mechanism built in and uh, and actually here let's listen to it the next one uh, has a little sound example Yeah, this was at, at the Fry Art Museum uh, several years ago, maybe eight years ago. And it was also coin operated. You had to insert 25 cents. And the reason with a coin uh, has uh, something to do with, first I had like certain interactive uh, instrument uh, installations with black and white keys so you could play uh, the installation with a keyboard. And I noticed that especially adults would come in and they see this keyboard, but then they would look around. When nobody was there, they would touch the key. Like kids, kids immediately would start to play, but adults was kind of afraid to touch the keys because they thought you had to be a pianist to, to play. And, and so there was kind of a, a strange part. And, and, uh, and then the next uh, interactive part was said, okay, let's just have a push button. And then I noticed people come in, they push the button, push the button, but then they walk away. So I said, well, that's not good. Let's see what's happened when they spend 25 cents. And then I noticed nobody was walking away until it was done. <laughs> because when you invest 25 cents, you want to see something for your investment. So, and uh, in this case at the Fry Art Museum, it was up for several months, but uh, there was like 14,000 quarters uh, in the box, and it went to the food uh, to the food bank. So uh, there was some meals, some happy meals uh, appreciated later. So uh, like this was another installation using uh, a piano adapter. Like this wooden box had like 88 uh, uh, fingers, like solenoids, and on top was some kind of a, a contraption. And this contraption was actually bowing the strings. Uh, uh, like it was rotating like a carousel and lowering down and then bowing, plucking the strings, stamping the strings or rotating. These balls would rotate very fast. So you could alter the whole sound of this uh, piano just by uh, preparing the strings in, in an instant way. So it was called uh, IPP 71512, like IPP instant prepared piano. Going a little bit back to John Cage, he prepared the pianos, but by hand. So you have to take it out and, and prepare it again. But this would actually prepare the machine uh, without, uh, uh, it would prepare it instant. Our other installation was uh, liquid percussion. This was like uh, up on the ceiling, there was over 100 water valves. And underneath, there was like this glass vessels. So you see, like, it's like a, a Dante Marioni, that's a Chihuly, or there's a Chihuly. There's a, a lot of glass artists, uh, 
uh, donated um, these objects because they was all tuned like inside some of these vessels. There was like um, drum heads, stretched membrane, like they are all tuned kind of uh, membranes, like there was the water would just hit these uh, membranes. So up here it was just like rain falling down and here's this keyboard. When you touched a, a key, then a water drip would fall down. And, uh, and the water drip was very precise. Every time you push the key, one drip was, would fall down. But it also was when you push the key very soft, a tiny drip would fall down. But when you push very hard, like with a higher velocity, you would have a, a bigger uh, uh, drip. So I was more interested in this installation to visualize music. And it's similar like, uh, like a player piano roll would, would uh, uh, fall down. Like you would see actually the rhythmic pattern, like one valve when you go like bum, 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 like one drip and then two drips and then one drip again. So over uh, this uh, spectrum, you actually saw the music, the rhythm fall down. And then a few seconds later or a second later, you could actually hear it. So it was just like uh, visualize how uh, the graphical notation looks like, and then in, in a short while, you could actually hear it. And then the water would recycle up uh, and, 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 and uh, going as long uh, you would, would play this. So uh, other, uh, a similar installation I also used like uh, with, with the valves, like when the valves are very close, like here they was quite far apart, but the other installation, I had the water valves very close together, and then you could actually spell letters. You, you just spell an A or a B or a C, so you could actually uh, spell letters. And the installation is up at the Snoqualmie Library, uh, one of these letter, uh, falling water letter speller. Like, uh, it's mainly aimed for children, uh, for kids. They have like a dial uh, when somebody's name is Abby A. You dial A, and then B, and then B, and then Y, whatever, and then you push a button, and then you see your, your name falling down. So it's just like a, a way how to learn to spell, because you create your own font in a way, so, and it's just using water drips. And uh, so that's always like the, the interest was always like to visualize how, how, how you make it very simple. That, that you actually see what, what's falling down. It wasn't just a rhythm, but interestingly, like an A sounds different from a B when it hits the water. Uh, so uh, a blind person who could actually distinguish between different letters, how they impact when, when they fall down without even seeing it. Uh, this was once a, a, a mobile sound installation. And this was pre kind of, uh, uh, let's say, not Bluetooth, but it was a wireless, a MIDI wireless uh, system where all these uh, instruments was uh, wirelessly uh, controlled. And this was actually a bumper shoot, uh, one installation like this performance where musicians as well uh, and these other kinetic instruments would, would be perfectly synchronized when they were strumming in, diff in different locations. So there was a conductor bike which was sending all the MIDI information wirelessly and then uh, the drums would be uh, perfectly synchronized together. Or sometimes working with uh, choreographers, I had a few times uh, the great, uh, like it was great pleasure to work with different uh, choreographers like from Seattle, like Wade, Wade Madsen, for example. Uh, other uh, collaboration was with uh, Elliot Feld in New York on a uh, piece. And then I also got commissioned from Merce Cunningham uh, to do compose a piece for his dance. And, uh, and of course, each, like, each piece has also like uh, different instructions then for, for, for dancers, how, how to move, how to uh, how to uh, make the sound. And in this, uh, let's see, let's go one more back. Like all the uh, costumes, there was full of, of acoustic instruments, like under the arm, there was like a pit pump. So when you go like this, you would actually uh, 
uh, play a flute or a reed instrument. In the shoes, there was like an air pump. So each movement, there was like eight pitches in each dance. Or, so each movement would make a particular pitch. So the right movement would actually play a certain melodic structure. So it was very difficult for them to practice because uh, one wrong move, a wrong tone. So uh, it, it wasn't simple to do this. And this was actually the score for Merce Cunningham's uh, piece. I'm working a lot with graphical scores first to see in, 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 in time and pitch range where certain kind of uh, parts are uh, playing together or not together. So that's always like uh, the graphical notation, very similar to the uh, player piano role. Uh, that's more like uh, to, to, to visualize how, how uh, a score, a musical score looks like. The other installation was like working just with air, like each of this uh, instrument, there was like flutes, uh, organ pipes. Down here there was duck calls, and in, in here there was reeds from, from accordions. And here at the podium, you had like other interactive part where there was only two knobs, and one knob would just play chromatically like the different uh, pitches. There was over 100, I think, 140 different flutes, different uh, MIDI-controlled uh, instruments. And uh, on the music stand here uh, with these dials, one dial would just uh, set the, the mode, the musical mode, and the other one, uh, the direction, how, how it should uh, move around in space. And that's also like uh, with this new movement, you actually can move the sound through the space in different directions, so you could follow and, and, and listen actually how the sound moves through, through the space. Well, this was a private uh, commission for uh, a doorbell. Like the, uh, it was my form, former landlord and he was building his uh, upstairs like he was remodeling. And he asked me how much uh, would it cost when I commission you to do a doorbell? Then I said, well, it's $1 a cubic inch. Then he said, okay, fine, let's do it. And so he told the framers, just leave a hole in the hallway, uh, leave a hole in there for the doorbell. So when I saw this hole once, when it was under construction, I thought, wow, quite a big hole. <laughs> and uh, because it was 24 inch by 48 inch and seven inch deep, so I said, well, that's like 5,180 cubic inches. So $5,000, you know, and not bad. <laughs> so I asked him, did you ever measure the hole? And he said, oh, money, no object. And uh, of course, immediately he went and measured. <laughs> and then he freaked. That I cannot afford a doorbell for $5,000. I said, well, it was a deal. And deal, it was a done deal. So sorry, you know, it's, it's done. <laughs> So I had a few months free rent and uh, some cash down. And, and, but when you was ringing the doorbell, the door button outside, uh, like the accordion would go up and down or the karate man would hit on, on the cymbals or the xylophone would play or the bells would play or uh, Teddy would open his mouth and the eyes would lit up. You know, there was a lot of things going on, like moving. And, and uh, oh yeah, here's Teddy again, yeah. And, Karate man. So it's still it's behind glass, but but uh, uh, and the deal was also in the first year that uh, when people come in, it was already done, so they didn't see how it works. So there was also like a, a money machine, twenty five cents, uh, right next to it, and the deal was that the first year, the money went in, into my pocket, and because I realized after the second year, everybody knows it, you know, they don't put any more money in there. So uh, so that's kind of. Again, like with a 25 cent with a coin operated machine. Uh, other investigation was also making sound with fire, like the fire organ. So there are some, uh, it's almost like a Bunsen burner built in, but it's more like a, a very a similar like a, a Bunsen burner, but where you can regulate the uh, temperature or the, the flame by adding a little bit oxygen to the flame by just pulling down a sleeve would heat up, uh, would get a higher temperature inside and cold, like warm air is rising. 
going through the glass tubes and then the extension was just aluminum. So a longer uh, tube had a more deeper a lower pitch and the shorter tubes had a higher pitch. So this was like two octaves and here was a keyboard and every time you push the key from a yellow flame you would see a blue flame and the blue flame was much more harder and then uh, you could hear the sound which was like an organ but much more richer because uh, there was way more overtones in each individual pitch so it was sounding as a very rich kind of sound, like almost like similar to our human voice. And it was the same octave range, only possible like our human voice. So it's very limited. And uh, so it's just like using thermodynamics to make sound. And once I had like a, a blind person and a deaf person in the audience. And of course the, the blind person could hear how, how uh, it sounds, but couldn't feel, uh, couldn't see anything, how it works, but through the warmth, like you actually, uh, the, the temperatures, when you touch it, you could feel it, and also how this sound was actually, how the body perceived the sound. So the, the deaf person uh, would actually watch the flame, the oscillation of the flame, and, and the deaf person immediately noticed when the, the oscillation was a certain kind of a range. When it was twice as fast, it was an octave higher. So you actually can see uh, almost when you really concentrate what kind of uh, pitch range, uh, it, what kind of pitch range it makes when, when you just uh, look at, at the flame, how it works. This was an installation uh, in Let's see, that's in St. Paul, Minnesota. It, it's like this giant uh, xylophone, uh, which was like in four parts. And each part was assigned to uh, a, a different continent. So it was hooked up to the seismic network, to the world uh, seismic network. So the, like when there's an earthquake, there's like a, a P wave, the primary wave and the secondary wave. And they almost look like, like sound waves. Like, of course, they are much more lower in frequency, but when you transpose them up, you can actually translate it into musical material. So every time an earthquake uh, happens, and there's over 20 earthquakes every day uh, with a Richter scale higher than number six. So, uh, so there's the whole day uh, uh, some activity. It's the whole day playing. So let's say the earthquake is in, in Asia, then... Let's see, this one was tuned in a pentatonic scale, so it's, it's easy to hear, like it sounds like a sound coming from, from, from Asia. So you know the earthquake was in Asia. Uh, or oh, the other one uh, is not in this picture, like uh, the African, when it's on the African continent, uh, there would be uh, more rhythmic patterns, uh, uh, drum, drum sounds coming. So each continent uh, was represented somehow culturally, musically. And people who worked there, they could immediately tell, you know, where the earthquake was coming from. And when it was over 6.5 Richter scale, then it was playing very fast Sundays. So, you know, there was a major earthquake. But then there were some monitors uh, on the bottom uh, where then people could actually get the real information where the earthquake, which uh, continent. And most of the earthquakes, of course, we don't read about or hear about because they're under the ocean or in Siberia or somewhere. So, but here, this plays almost every earthquake, so it's quite active. And then, of course, uh, the notation, like when I compose a piece, I always do first, like a, almost like a blueprint. Uh, like here, there's a lot of kind of notes uh, kind of playing together, and it gets more and more complex. But that's how I see it first, like to make first like the visual or translating the visual idea in a graphical uh, notation and then using this material uh, to make then more, uh, uh, writing more the, the score out of it. Or sometimes using this post-it, you know, and, and post it in different kind of configuration and see how, how actually this would, would, would sound like or look like. So it's always like a different kind of way, like here, for example, it would start all together, but then it would depart again. So this all helps. Uh, to, to configure out later what, what, uh, what I want to actually do with this particular uh, piece, what I'm focusing on, what I'm looking into it. And this always helps uh, 
like sometimes two months later, I, I don't remember what I did, you know, but uh, just l looking, looking more closer into it, then I remember cer cer certain parts and this always helps to, to, to get going. This was a piece for, uh, it was actually on Lake Union. The piano had also like this wooden box, like uh, this uh, player piano uh, box sitting. And there was like a hydrophone going into the water. And the hydrophone would take like the audio signal transferring from the audio into a MIDI, like in, into um, a MIDI uh, signal where the piano would start to play. So it was for opening day, uh, boats opening day. So when, when a, a diesel engine boat would go by, it was, was more like a staccato, like, duck, like the diesel engine duck, 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 duck underwater. So the piano would play more kind of staccato uh, sounds. And, and when a jet ski would go by, it would play glissandis like back and forth. So it was more like uh, the underwater sound pollution, the awareness of underwater sound pollution. Because when you are a fish down there, you don't want to be down there when a boat goes nearby. It's really noisy and, and loud. So this kind of showed uh, just like tr translating this kind of information from under there, you know, in, 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 in playing uh, just above uh, the water level. So the, the boaters, of course, they thought it's neat or it's, 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 it's cool, but they didn't realize what, what they actually do when, when they're driving by with their uh, boats. This was an installation called Conlon in Purple in name of uh, the composer Conlon Nencaro, which composed uh, mostly for player pianos. He would punch all his player, uh, his, his, his notation into player piano roles because his music was way too complex to play uh, with hands. So in this installation, I had like six different levels. Uh, there was also like uh, this interactive part with these wheels and, and dials. So, for example, uh, when you walked through the installation, there was like, uh, you basically walked inside the instrument, but sometimes the sound would only be on the lower level and then suddenly above you. So uh, below ear level or above, so you really could distinguish where the sound was coming from and playing. It was just like uh, walking into this and, and you really can follow the sound being up there or being uh, down there or then ear level or going in different directions. And that's always like uh, the, somehow the calculations where the pitches will be when you hang like six columns, you know, and, and, and how to make everything. So I do everything on my own. I don't have any assistance. Uh, so that's mostly like first like the concept and then making a prototype and uh, and then I, I have assistance when, when it's like a, a bigger project like a p public artwork then I have assistance because then there's a budget maybe but otherwise there is no budget for assistance so uh, but for this project uh, I definitely had assistance and uh, there was uh, that EMP and the piece is called uh, If Six Was Nine. And uh, it's, it's right in the center part uh, at the EMP. And I was a finalist. Uh, I don't know how many artists uh, was asked, but there was like a, a big Frank Gehry acrylic model of the whole EMP before it, or when it was still under construction or before construction. And uh, the finalists, they had to come with uh, a markup uh, which would fit exactly into the acrylic uh, model. So they could actually see how the piece would, would fit in there. So I made, uh, the markup was about one and a half feet tall, made out of these tiny guitars, which was all five, about 500 uh, cut out tiny guitars. And I made photocopies of guitars reduced uh, the, the image, cut it out, glued it on the, so it looked like a guitar. And then it was, you know, put inside the big uh, uh, acrylic model. And, and I remember uh, there was a big meeting like with uh, Paul Allen and I don't know, it was about 10 people, probably most of them was lawyers. I don't know what, uh, there was just like a, a big group of people what nobody said anything except him. And, uh, and 
I had like uh, the model and I had the sketches of, of the uh, more or less the concept and I was talking about that there are guitar, these guitars and they would um, like these mechanical guitars they would play whatever genre uh, you can imagine because they, they pluck themselves, they, they fret themselves and, uh, and they just play themselves and then Paul Allen was kind of shuffling through all the paper work from, from former works, you know, and, and I, I kind of talked how, how the whole thing uh, might work. And, and uh, so then he suddenly said, uh, so who is going up there and are tuning the guitars? And of course, I wasn't prepared for this really because uh, it was just a presentation. And when there is no check in the mail, you don't think too hard. And uh, so it was just like, okay, so I was kind of not prepared for, for this and said, well, uh, the guitars up there, uh, they, the guitars, oh, the guitars tune themselves. Then the first time he looked in my eyes and said, wow. And of course, at the same one, said, oh, what did I say? <laughs> so, but uh, they are actually tuning themselves. It's a very simple procedure. Uh, up, like each guitar has just one string, so you would need you know six guitars uh, to play uh, or have one complete guitar. And there's all these mechanical frettles, and and uh, and it's now 14 years since it was up, and they are still plugging away every day. Unfortunately, all the commercial uh, equipment broke down. Like the kiosk was r running on Windows 98, and they're all gone. Nothing works anymore, but I'm using, I developed my own circuitry, my own microprocessors. They are still fine and they're still running, but now it's actually uh, this, the end of this year or beginning of next year, we, we start to uh, do some kind of uh, maintenance uh, to, to replace some of the plucking motors because when they plug every day, the, the, uh, they just wear out and, and, and uh, but Everything after 14 years, it's still kind of up and running. So that's, I'm always surprised. Why would this you know, hold as long and, and run as long? Some leftovers, uh, I made my own kind of uh, uh, guitar uh, installation, which also played all kind of different uh, sound. Uh, so here. So I'm, I'm teaching sometimes at, at uh, Stanford and, and at Princeton, and both have their own laptop orchestras. So I thought, well, I make just my own laptop percussion sextet. <laughs> and uh, they're actually all my old laptops, which I used, which broke. And they was then used for this laptop percussion sextet. And, uh, and at this time when I made this, uh, I also was starting to do an app developing an app so you could actually start with with the app and this is about four or five years ago and so when the app was done I worked with a, a former student of mine and I was ready to have it on the i i i store no what is it called the i the app store I guess I said look I'm paying every year my 99 dollar fee so it's I'm done I want to have this on the app store because it's I can run installations in a museum and it's free for the people who want to use it. So I got an email back from Apple saying, sorry, your app uh, is not approved. It won't be on the, on the app store because it has zero functionality. So I thought, oh, that's strange. You know, I wrote back and said, look, there's a lot of functionality going on when I push the button. I can activate all these installations, these instruments. Email came back, sorry, 
we don't see any functionality in this app, so it won't be on the store. So I got mad. So look, I paid my $99 since two years, you know, and, and uh, so I, 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 there's a lot of, you know, functionality. So the first time I actually went to the uh, app store and looked what's on there, I was running immediately in some apps which I thought had zero functionality, like one, a fart app, you know. <laughs> so what functionality, you know, does a fart app? So I wrote back that, look, I can prove way more than this application which are on this app store. So then they make me, okay, we, we want to see a video of the functionality. And, uh, and then I, I thought, okay, maybe I use my Apple uh, laptops, you know, like, uh, and show when I, you know, push the button, they actually play. And at the same time at my studio, I, when I was working on the library project, I had this spelling, water spelling, uh, uh, prototype hanging in my studio. So I said, look, uh, here on my iPod, play, and then you saw A falling down, P falling down, P falling down, L falling down, E falling down, you know, and, and, uh, and then I can also play my laptop percussion sextet, and then the next day it says, your application is approved. <laughs> So at this time, they didn't realize that uh, out of this iPod, you know, they always thought an iPhone, it should come out of there. They didn't realize that you actually uh, would act, actuate or uh, trigger other things. Of course, right now you can open, you know, turning on lights or your garage door can open. But at this time, they didn't think that something else, you know, would be, uh, would have a functionality to do. So it's always funny to, to, uh, tell them, you know, and then they're always so embarrassed later, you know, how, how, how things turned out. Uh, other installation at the airport, uh, which is right next to the uh, people mover, uh, and this uh, two contraption inside, which are uh, triggered by uh, reflection of the light, and, and uh, it's kind of rotating very slowly, and there are certain motors which bring everything kind of uh, in motion. It's... Uh, like this, like this, this rain stick would go down, or here actually there's Elvis on this uh, kind of uh, unicycle uh, platform. So when this goes, it's moving uh, up and down a little bit. So he just moves back and forth, and a ball inside would hit the symbol. So everything kind of uh, moves, starts to move when people uh, on on the people mover uh, walking by, or like there's like the the dog, the dog sniffing, dog is running uh, up and down, and, and so everything is kind of this kinetic uh, kind of contraption which uh, just moves very slowly back and forth. And it's always like when you are uh, applying for this kind of grants, uh, the jury sometimes they don't realize that uh, they always ask, do you have some photographs? And tell them, no, it doesn't exist yet. Like it has to be built, you know, there's nothing uh, out there. And I wouldn't put something in there which would, you know, exist somewhere else. So it's always hard to convince them because uh, you're coming up, you know, like with this kind of drawings and even they cannot visualize anything, you know, like uh, from a drawing. So it's always hard to convince a jury uh, to, uh, you know, coming up with certain kind of, uh, just, just with some sketches or drawing because you're, Competing, you know, there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of artists always uh, applying for this kind of public artwork. And uh, so you have, somehow you have to get the jury interested, but it's sometimes hard just showing up with some sketches. And, and uh, so uh, other um, challenge was once uh, doing an installation for uh, a science museum in Germany, which was designed by Saha Hadid. And she was quite famous for uh, designing buildings which cannot be built. And, uh, but this was one uh, which uh, it's called Faino. Uh, and when you apply as an artist, uh, there's always like a, a kind of an introduction of the, when you apply for this, it should uh, be, uh, it should do this or this and this, it should fit in there or whatever. For this, com uh, for this, uh, uh, 
project, they was asking, it has to be connected to mathematics, to music, to, to all the sciences. So I thought, okay, I just um, come up with three kind of uh, rings, and each ring has a sphere built in, and they are in the ratio of three to four to five, like going back to Pythagoras. Um, they're also like three meters, four meters, and five meters in diameter. And I thought I want to visualize different, uh, different, especially music, uh, but without even hearing the music, but you can see how uh, uh, a major chord, like the C, E, G, looks like when, when, when it's rotating. And also like when it's rotating, and there's like back, back here, it's like the three axis uh, kind of uh, teeter totter and the cables go way up there and coming down. And it's just like an XY configuration to bring the ring, into, get the sphere into the motion. You have an amplitude, you go very uh, uh, down with the highest amplitude, and then you get a frequency. Like with these two values, you get actually uh, the, the sphere into rotation. So when you play, uh, let's say, the CAG uh, chord, when you would have a very bright uh, a light going, uh, shining across on the wall, you actually see the shadow with the sine wave. You see the amplitude, you see the frequency, how fast it's going. And when it's absolutely quiet, you could actually hear the, the CEG humming from, from this, uh, how, how it moves. So it, it was going different, not just uh, in music, it was different modes. You could also tell when you go into the time mode, you could tell what time it is. So the biggest ring, the sphere, would take 12 hours per revolution. The middle one, 60 minutes per revolution, and this one, 60 seconds. So when you know uh, where 12 o'clock is, so you can tell, let's say 12 o'clock is, is back there. So here it's 6, 15, and 58 seconds. So you could, when you look up, you could actually see what time it is. But it's a very boring mode because it takes like 12 hours for the biggest sphere to go one revolution. So it's not very, very active except for the, for, for the 60 seconds. But then you have also like the, uh, astro, uh, the astro mode, which uh, shows like the tempo or the, the orbital orbital uh, relation between Mars, Earth, and Venus, because they're also in the ratio almost, not quite, but uh, ratio three to four to five. So when Earth is done one revolution, Mars is still working on it because uh, Mars takes, you know, 600, whatever, 80 days, uh, and then Venus is already done uh, twice. So. Uh, when you look up, you actually see the temporal relation between the three planets. So you just go in different modes, and, and let's see what other mode. Uh, there was like two or three other modes. I, I don't remember. Hmm. Uh, such a long time. But, uh, and that's just like motors are down there, very precision motors with a feedback system, and they would uh, know exactly how to start and how to actually reverse the phase so you can go uh, backwards. And I did this, uh, just one, uh, the prototype ring I did at the Suyama space uh, in, in Seattle, where it was just uh, playing basically, or moving, uh, playing in one octave range, so that the slowest would be the fundamental tone, and it was going twice as fast it was uh, an octave higher, but it was more visualize. Uh, it was more to visualize it, and also like again, when when you see the shadow, uh, you could actually see the the sine wave and and the amplitude and frequency. The other installation was once uh, using uh, I think twenty four carousel slide uh, slide re slide recorders. What do you call the slide? Uh, Project, slide projectors, right? Uh, and I used them as a rhythmic, as a musical instrument. And I collected from Salvation Army and Goodwill all these family slides. Sometimes you find a whole bag full of uh, a trip to Italy or a trip to England, whatever. 
And, and interestingly, they are all almost identical. You see everybody in front of the Colosseum or front of the Eiffel Tower or so. All these family photos, they was almost identical except for different phases. And they would play very, very fast, like you would see the slide only uh, less than, than a second because it was <laughs> that the whole sound of the slide projectors was actually uh, the percussive instrument. And then there was like this video or this uh, CRT uh, 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 tubes that was just like from a TV manufacturer. And I used a very small kind of a valve in the back who would push the air uh, through uh, this small shaft. And it was just like a, like a very interesting sound, but it was again spatially uh, going on all over. So it was kind of the, um, inversion, like the slide projector uh, made the sound, which supposed to do the image, but then uh, the CRT screen made the sound and not the image. Or uh, Shanghai was an installation where uh, there was like uh, 36 uh, uh, bamboo, uh, bamboo tubes, and inside the bamboo was a reed, and all these vessels that was filled with water. So when slowly the bamboo goes into the water, air gets pushed up and the reed gets into vibration and it would make a sound. So you would see any time uh, the bamboo moves into the water or out of the water, uh, it made a sound. And the score was back there. There was about 2,000 CDs. And the CD was just used as a player piano roll, but optical sensors would just look for a reflection of the CD and whenever they saw a CD, which was assigned, like each line was assigned to one of the pitches. And then uh, when it would see a, a CD back there, it would move the uh, bamboo because there was all these motors up there on the top, which would move slowly the, the, uh, the bamboo back and forth. Instead of the wall scanner, I did once an eight foot CD. So slowly this arm would rotate and just read with this optical uh, reflector, optical sensors would read the score. So that's also how to uh, interact with, with uh, uh, or how to visualize how actually a CD works. But this CD was eight foot in diameter or the check box, which is a, a commission from a private uh, collector. And then sometimes first, I'm, I'm doing first the graphical kind of uh, outlines or project uh, working with the Kronos Quartet, where actually the check box was, was used uh, as a part. And the collaboration with the Kronos was to work um, together as a collaboration. And they also had to play some toy instruments and toy violins, and they first said, oh, no problem, That's, we can do it. But then they realized it's not so simple to play a toy violin, and they really kind of got into it, and they played actually very nice, nicely on this uh, toy violins. A piece I was uh, commissioned uh, from Creative Capital in New York, which was performed uh, in, this was actually here in Seattle uh, at, on the boards, but it was starting uh, at Stanford. It was a piece about um, the village I come from, from Germany. All the Jews from this village and from the whole region was sent to an internment camp in France, in the Pyrenees, which uh, was used first for the political refugees coming from Spain fighting against uh, the Franco-fascism in 1939. And when the, em when the camp was then empty in 1940, the French uh, regime, the Vichy regime offered the Nazi an empty camp so they can put the Jews in this empty camp. But they, of course, they got per head uh, five francs. So uh, and this one Nazi um, Gauleiter offered Hitler uh, a deal saying, look, I can make this region uh, Judenfrei, like free of Jews in no time. And, uh, and everybody was then uh, taken by train to this uh, camp in, in the Pyrenees. And, uh, and two years later, they was all uh, shipped from, from this camp in the Pyrenees via Paris to, to, uh, to Auschwitz. 
So nobody survived, and, and this piece was about uh, growing up in this uh, village or in this town and uh, trying to comprehend what actually happened. And I could only do this going there to this camp, uh, former camp, which is completely gone. There's nothing else anymore. And, uh, but it, it was necessary for me to, to work on this since my, practically my, my adult life, uh, just to comprehend. And at the same time, uh, finding certain ways like uh, finding trees, because I knew the trees are, they was there 40 years ago, uh, 70 years ago. And, and uh, using like the bark of, of the trees, transcribing, uh, which almost looked like a player piano roll, and give me a certain kind of a, a timing structure and a pitch configuration, and then, then transcribing it uh, to a score. And this was actually uh, the score for uh, the soprano voice. So just using material, uh, I knew nobody was, of course, uh, all the witnesses, uh, they was gone. But this was kind of uh, a witness for me, because I knew this was kind of, uh, this tree was there before, and, and just this kind of material was, was necessary uh, to use to, to really comprehend. Or public uh, artworks, uh, this is an Ojai, uh, the sound arch when you walk underneath. It's like a 24 uh, pitched uh, xylophone, and it starts to play. And a former uh, student of mine, uh, Albert, he was playing with the installation uh, and, and the accordion. And this was like the composer I talked before, Conlon and Caro. He was American, and he was fighting actually in uh, Spain. He was also interned nearby the girls' camp, uh, not for very long because uh, all the American um, uh, fighters in, in like the Lincoln Brigade in, in Spain, they could get paperwork from, from uh, the embassy in Paris and they could leave the camp. But uh, Nancaro was also interned and uh, he started, uh, and then when he returned in 1940, uh, the American government refused to give him a passport so there was like, you know, Hemingway, uh, Langs Langston McHughes, uh, uh, different intellectuals went to Spain and they all immigrated somewhere else. And then Caro ended up in Mexico City and he was starting to uh, pu uh, punching all his complex music into uh, the player piano roles. And in 1950, he was starting to build this huge percussion machine. And uh, these are all kind of... Uh, ceramic parts where he stretched over uh, some of them also uh, brass drums like metal drums and wooden uh, wood blocks and he tried to run everything from from the player piano mechanism and when he was done building all the drums and running like the nomadic air uh, lines to all the different uh, beetle mechanism he realized that it didn't work because it's too long for, for the air to travel to make it uh, going very fast. So basically he abandoned uh, in 1950 the whole kind of percussion uh, set and dumped it behind his studio. And, uh, and in, in the early 19, when was it? In, in the late 1980s, uh, I went to Mexico. I was building this machine who can read the player piano rolls. So I scanned all his work and uh, so it could be stored in a, uh, in a MIDI database. And then it was also possible that uh, this work can be played on any kind of MIDI compatible instrument. So it, first I was uh, designing a, a scanner, similar I showed before, using light, light beams. Every time the light was going through the, pa through the perforation, a photo sensor would you know, detect like this whole like this musical information but then uh, I went to Mexico and and scanned the first roll and we was listening uh, after the scanning and he said something doesn't sound right and I had testing rolls and everything and testing and everything was run on a on a just on a, on a lap not on a laptop on, on a Mac plus whatever at this time and I realized that sometimes when he was punching a wrong hole, he would use scotch tape to tape it over. 
so the air wouldn't go through anymore, but my light beam was going through the scotch tape. So he was editing a lot with scotch tape, so I had to go back and, and, and build the other machine, the other scanner, which actually worked with suck, like, like a tracker bar from the player piano, worked with air. So every time a, a, a hole was going over the tracker bar, uh, suction uh, was created in this chamber, and there was a small kind of an air sensor, and every time the air sensor got the signal, it would register uh, this particular node. And it was very precise, so, but I had to hook it up to a vacuum cleaner because I need suction. So I went to Mexico uh, with my computer, with this uh, uh, scanner and, and, and this vacuum cleaner, but it worked perfect. So Nencaro was born in 1912, so 2012, uh, the Berkeley Art Museum, uh, did some kind of a centennial celebration. So I went back to Mexico and whatever instrument survived, like all the ceramic uh, instruments, uh, they survived. And some of the wood blocks survived because the termites didn't like uh, plywood. They would eat all the other natural wood, but not the plywood. It was some kind of a, a, a mahogany plywood. So all these wood, wood drums, except I had to rebuild all the frameworks because the framework was done with normal pine wood. So, but then I uh, also uh, didn't use pneumatic actuator. I used all mechanical, uh, electromechanical actuators. And he also composed a piece for, for a prepared piano where the strings was actually wrote, uh, kind of plucked like <coughs> with this rotation material. And I know the Nencaro, it's called the Nencaro Percussion Orchestra, uh, which are all original uh, drums from the 1950s, except for the uh, beetle mechanism. And that's now uh, installed. Uh, I have a studio up in Tieton near Yakima. And, and, and when you get in there, you can actually listen to uh, different uh, compositions, which was I found when I sc scanned all his information. Uh, oh, maybe we should stop. It's already three, right? Uh, well, I could go on because you <coughs> might have some questions, right? It's up to you. Because there's not much. Uh, let's see. There's just like some other uh, uh, piano stuff, and and uh, like this piano was uh, suspended, uh, hanging to get a completely different kind of acoustical uh, uh, kind of when it would sit with the three legs on the floor, it's kind of damping, but when it's suspended, it has a completely different resonance. Or building a, a house out of pianos. This was in a, in a park uh, uh, in New York, and it was, in, out, it was outside, so every week it sounds different because of the rain. So uh, this was uh, just like uh, this hammer mechanism. It was bowing the strings and hammering, so it could actually play any kind of uh, musical uh, song because he, this would be the C and the C sharp would be here and then the D on the other side and the, so it would just go around and play the strings but after I don't know how it sounds right now because it's, I'm sure it's completely out of tune. Oh, this was an installation uh, at the Seattle Sculpture Park. There was three listening stations. One was like uh, silence, sound and music and the music had like a, a buried toy piano and uh, and it was piped through the piping and the sound would come out here. And the middle ones, the sound had like a, a, a rain stick sound, like the ocean sound. And the, the other one, uh, silence question mark, you would listen to the trains and the traffic. And, and uh, so it was just like a listening station where you uh, had to take out your earphones and, 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 and perceive different phones. So let's uh, stop here. Uh, so maybe we have a few minutes for, for some questions. Sure, sure. Um, questions, anyone? <laughs> questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, first of all. Uh, how many arms do you wish you had? <laughs> <laughs> Just to speak? No. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, oh, to do what? You know, it's not so much, it's more the time, you know, like, uh, it's always like you need time uh, to do it. Like, for example, like the water dripping, uh, you know, like uh, I just use a, a normal kind of a dispensing valve, you know, like from a uh, 
choose, you know, dispenser, but then they're clicking very loud, you know, you have to make uh, the changes. But then the nozzle was a difficult part when you have one drip, you know, a perfect drip falling down. Uh, this took months probably to get the right nozzle because when you push once a button and a drip is falling down, you want to make sure the next one is there. When one would be missing, it wouldn't be good enough. So, but then sometimes it takes time. I remember uh, one night I got really frustrated uh, because it didn't drip, the water drip wasn't nice. So I went to the freezer, got the vodka out of the freezer, poured maybe a stiff drink, and I realized, wow, the viscosity is different. So immediately I went, put vodka in there, and it was a beautiful drip. <laughs> so, but I knew I couldn't, you know, have the whole system running with vodka <laughs> and had to be frozen. But just, you know, like sometimes uh, then you start thinking, so it's more like the time, not so much the arms, you know, like uh, it's, it's always the time which is the biggest uh, issue. Other questions? Do, do you compose music separately from the uh, machinery that you make? I, Actually, right now I'm composing a piece for uh, the Seattle Symphony, and I try to get rid of the musician, but legally I have to have a few musicians. <laughs> and, uh, but that's okay. I'm using probably only a very small chamber orchestra. But the conductor, uh, it's an installation which will be in the Benaroya foyer, like in the grand lobby, and there will be all the instruments which I'm building right now suspended. And, uh, and I'm working on this, uh, like... The hanging uh, piano, uh, the red piano, had actually a music stand in front, and the music stand had a stereoscopic camera built in. So you could only start the piano when you go upbeat and downbeat. So uh, it's basically like gesture control. And for the symphony project, uh, I'm working uh, where the conductor, Ludovic Molo, actually conducts the musicians, which are on the balcony in different places. Uh, and he also conducts the kinetic instruments. So right now I'm working with a former student of mine. He works now for Intel, and uh, they're working on this kind of gesture uh, control uh, system. And we, he's actually coming next weekend uh, to, to work on more prototypes. And uh, we tried different kind of um, uh, cameras, but the Kinect so far worked best because with the Kinect you could be uh, far away the uh, light configuration is not too uh, uh, sensitive, so it looks like the Kinect is probably uh, the camera or the uh, interactive part we are using. And Dimitri, like the student, um, they, uh, he has like the developer, uh, the Kinect developer unit, so, uh, so he will be next weekend here back up in Seattle where we try to um, figure out uh, that it's possible to, to do dynamic changes, uh, do, of course, different sequences. You can stop the sequence, go to, to the next one, and everything is done with gesture control. And, of course, the conductor of the symphony, Ludovic, he's already nervous because, of course, he doesn't want to look like a fool. You know, when he's doing something, nothing works. So... Uh, he uh, will also come, so we have to learn from him what kind of gestures are uh, necessary to learn how he's, he stops, how he moves on, how he starts, whatever. So that's kind of a project right now, working with the symphony, and at the same time, also working with uh, young composers. They uh, sign up uh, every year uh, with the sound bridge of the symphony, so the young composers have also then the possibility to compose for the installation uh, a piece. Uh, it will be up for several months at the Benaroya Hall, like in the foyer. Uh, and then the young composers, they are like 16, 18 years old, and, and they have then the chance to, to compose uh, for this. But back to the question, like I'm, I'm mainly composing for the kinetic uh, uh, installation. And each installation, of course, has a score, and, and everything is kind of... Uh, uh, written, but they are not really composed for musicians. But this one has to be. And of course, uh, dealing with the union, like uh, this, they can refuse, you know, to play anything which looks more, more like, uh, uh, how should I say, it? experimental. So they want to have everything perfectly notated. So uh, which makes it a little bit different, different when when you work with 
kind of this kind of installations. But I have to deal with the situation and. Uh, and I was told, uh, it was a grant from New Music USA. They gave five orchestras in the United States uh, a grant that the orchestra could choose a composer to work with uh, to do a special project. So the performance will be May 1st. And uh, like two years ago, they told me already when the rehearsals are. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so they, uh, everything is kind of uh, perfectly planned. And, and uh, so... Uh, so I might be confused like this as two, two o'clock, and uh, it, it's three o'clock, right? It's three o'clock. Three o'clock, okay, yeah. yeah. Maybe one more question. Okay. Where do you get your inspiration from, and how do you pass on your inspiration to your students or apprentice? If you don't have an assistant, how does this knowledge or innovation pass it on? Well, I have some uh, teaching residencies and still ongoing since years at, at Cal Arts. And every semester I am going there, uh, at the beginning of the semester, uh, there's a certain student group, mostly five, eight, between five, maybe 10. Uh, they want to learn this. They want to, they are really interested uh, in this field. And uh, so at the beginning, I will give them uh, like one time, uh, the easiest part would be working with percussion instruments, of course, because it's just like, uh, some kind of uh, very simple motion to, to figure out. So every year it, it's a little bit more advanced. So, and with this group of students, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very interesting to work with because they are really into it. So we have quite a, a lot of communication going on. And at the end of the semester, they call it the expo, where they have actually a public performance where they don't want to uh, embarrass themselves so they really get something going and done and and uh, so that's kind of uh, the focus I don't want to waste my time with students who just what should we do today you know like uh, that's kind of uh, it's more like focusing on on these students I have like two PhD uh, students uh, one from New Zealand they would actually come to my studio living there or staying there for maybe a couple weeks and and uh, because in my studio everything is there like you don't have to order whatever and wait uh, for a while it's, it's like a laboratory where you can work so that's kind of that's how I feel and wish to give this kind of uh, have this kind of apprentice uh, uh, going on this principle of, of uh, teaching and uh, so that's kind of, it's a lot of like uh, hands on. You have to learn how to work with a milling machine or with a drill because everything has to be made. They actually, uh, my students have to learn to uh, use, learn first like solid work so they can model their uh, instrument in solid works. And then they start uh, uh, to, to think about how, you know, how it looks from the top, how you actually create this. Of course, now you have the 3D printers and everything. So, but they have to, learn the basics first, how to put a model, a certain kind of idea, so you can actually print it out with a 3D printer. So that's kind of what I still miss that all, especially in this country, there is no, almost zero anymore, like hands-on approach, how to learn the basics uh, to build anything, because you have to learn it from, from the beginning to, to really understand, or from, from the basics to understand, uh, f from step to step and, and uh, so the facilities are gone like schools got rid of the shop the auto shop whatever and this was always the first uh, experiment for for students you know like to have something building something you know make something different and and unfortunately that's less and less kind of happened and all the industries is not willing to spend any money for this kind of apprenticeship programs like it's in Europe like I had to go through a four-year program where the first three months was like uh, learning, like kind of learning working with wood. But then you have to identify leaves. You have to identify the wood itself, which way it was grown, because you look first, which, where's the grain going, and then you cut it or shave it, you know, like just like very basic things uh, are not taught anymore. And, and, uh, and especially like in, in this field I'm doing, when I work with students, uh, they uh, also have to, work first making like a, a, a model out of cardboard or whatever. And then they see uh, how difficult it's actually just to make a, a very small model. So that's kind of a, a sad part in a way that all this kind of um, 
skills are not uh, taught anymore to, to really have something hands-on and make something very simple. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give it a Well, thanks for coming.